I know. Because that was no the issue. Mm. <coughs> well, if the men...
て。Advent is a wonderful season of remembrance and anticipation. We enter now this Sunday into the second Sunday of this Advent season. I want you to hear what the prophet Isaiah wrote. He said, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, the one who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And John, the messenger of God, proclaimed to all the people who came to him in the wilderness that they must repent of their sin and be baptized. The Bible tells us that many people heard his message, did indeed repent and were baptized in the River Jordan. It has become our custom, not only in this church, but throughout the world, to prepare for the birth of the Messiah by decorating our cities and homes, 
the hanging lights inside and out. And by measuring the quality of our Christmas morning by the number of gifts we receive. But today, let's think differently. As we light the second candle of the Advent wreath, we do so this day in preparation not for the coming of gifts that we buy, but anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. And to do so, perhaps we need to listen again to the message John the Baptizer was giving for all of us, for all time. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the paths. Repent of your sins. Be baptized. And live holy lives devoted to God. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Good morning, Sarah and Methodist Church. Uh, it is indeed a beautiful second Sunday of Advent, this season of light as we come together and we prepare our hearts once again for the coming of the Christ child as we meditate and reflect on the words of John the Baptizer for repentance, the daily fall at the feet of the mercy of God, and as we celebrate the promise of God, that in all things God makes a promise and God keeps a promise. So we'll be celebrating that all throughout our service this morning. Uh, I would invite you, as we continue on with the service, as we celebrate communion and singing and praying and everything else going on this morning, that you would begin this time together with me with a prayer. Most gracious God, we thank you uh, for the beauty of this day. We thank you that you have brought us together. We thank you that you have given us another opportunity to worship. And so during this time, during this very busy season, let us put aside all thoughts of what we have to do. Instead, celebrate this morning what we get to do, to come into your house, to make a joyful noise, by your spirit to reorient our lives on what really matters. First in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, let's sing our first song. Oh, come all you faithful, and you have come today. Let's stand together.
as we remain standing and, and recite our affirmation of faith, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Worship to the Lord this morning. We're singing We Three Kings.
come now to our time of offering and our time of prayer. As a reminder, our offering plates are available at the entrance of our worship space. If you would like to leave your offering for the church there on coming in or going out, uh, but we will continue to hold the next several moments um, as a sacred time, as a quiet time, a time of prayer. And this morning, I would invite you uh, to meditate on, celebrate uh, the promises of God, uh, that the promises of God are timeless as we come together during this season of Advent, that as God promised a Savior through the prophets, what we celebrate during Advent is the coming of the fulfillment of that promise. So I invite you to begin this time of prayer with me. Most merciful Lord, during this season of Advent, on this second Sunday, we lift up in thanksgiving that you are good that you are merciful, that you are love, you are peace, you are hope, you are joy. That as you have made a promise, you have kept a promise. That the promises you make are timeless. We celebrate today that because you have made a promise and kept a promise, we are different people. That you open the door to salvation for all people you loved us when we were yet sinners. And we pray this morning that as we spend the next few moments together in prayer as individuals and as a church, as we reflect on the meaning of this season, as we reflect on the lighting of the candles and the growing light that is present in our everyday lives as we move closer to the birth of your son, we do pray that that light would grow within us that we would be so full of it. We would share it with a broken and hurting world, that our words would speak life, that our actions would show a transformed heart, and that others might see the light in a dark and hurting world. For in Christ's name we do pray. I just want y'all to remember my brother Robert back here in the back. He's having a terrible toothache this morning. But like a good soldier, he showed up for the battle. Yes, color in Christmas for the whole 
is being seated, I would invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. And we'll begin our reading at verse 5 and read into the end of verse 25. And once again, we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, starting at verse 5, reading to the end of verse 25. During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous before God, blameless in their observance of all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant and they were both very old. One day Zechariah was serving as a priest before God because his priestly division was on duty. Following the customs of priestly service, he was chosen by lottery to go into the Lord's sanctuary and burn incense. All the people who gathered to worship were praying outside during this hour of incense offering. An angel from the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and overcome with fear. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to your son, and you must name him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many people will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the Lord's eyes. He must not drink wine and liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He will bring many Israelites back to the Lord their God. He will go forth before the Lord, equipped with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children, and he will turn the disobedient to righteous patterns of thinking. He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news to you. Know this. What I have spoken will come true with the proper time, but because you didn't believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered why he was in the sanctuary for such a long time. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he gestured to them and couldn't speak. When he completed the days of his priestly service, he returned home. Afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. She kept to herself for five months, saying, This is the Lord's doing. He has shown his favor to me by removing my disgrace among other people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Most merciful Lord, we do pray this morning that as we come together in your name, as we have sung praises to your name, as we have already been praying today, that as we turn now to Scripture, your, heart, your, your Spirit would move within our hearts, opening them and our eyes and our ears as well, that we may receive a word from you as we look at the example of Elizabeth and Zechariah and celebrate your character. So we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together would be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. 
On this second Sunday of Advent, our theme word for this morning, the word in which you will hear several times throughout our time together, is promise. Now, what is a promise? It is simply when someone says they will do something and he or she will do something. You know that they will do whatever it is that they say that they will do. Advent itself is the fulfillment of a promise, and it is the fulfillment of a promise that God made centuries before the birth of Jesus that he spoke through the prophets and brought to the people, saying that a Savior was coming, a Savior would be born, and Advent is the celebration of the preparation of that time of the coming Messiah that God made a promise and God keeps a promise. And not only did God fulfill this promise, he did so in a way that would defy all expectations. And I want us to work through the theme of promise and us and use it as a touchstone to unpack a few aspects of the character of God and what we truly have to celebrate in this season. So the first thing I want to start off, this is going to be the first point of the morning, I want to start off with a simple observation. A promise is only as trustworthy as the dependability of the character who makes it. True story? A promise is only as dependable as the character of the person who makes it. Again, what is a promise? If, if I say I'm going to do something, you can bet the farm that I'm going to do it. I promise I will do something. Someone else promises they will do something. But in interacting with people, what you will quickly find is that people treat promises differently because people have different characters. Some honor the promise and some do not. For some, making a promise doesn't hold much weight. If a person promises you again, this is just kind of building up to where we're going. If a person makes a promise again and again and again and again and never actually fulfills the promise they make again and again and again, what does that tell you about the next time they make a promise? Ooh, don't listen to it. <laughs> don't trust it. Or you just may nod your head and go, oh, okay, whatever. But I, I was thinking about this this week. Um, you, you don't trust the promise of the person who makes it. I was thinking about uh, growing up and, and the weight of a promise that, that my parents taught me. That when you make a promise, you, you keep a promise. And the funny thing is, there's one very particular way I, I remember how this played out as a child, okay? Um, because I knew as a child, because what my parents had taught me, that promises made were of a promise you should keep. Don't make them, you know, kind of willy-nilly. So I'll give you this story. Um, I knew growing up as a child that if there was a particular place I wanted to go as a child, let's say Toys R Us, rest in peace, but Toys R Us, if I wanted to go that day, I would ask my parents, do you promise to take me to Toys R Us? And if they said yes, I knew I was going, and I was excited. I knew it was going to happen because they never made a promise that they took lightly. They made the promise, and you knew you were going to go. Now, there was the other response. They could say no, but there was the other response. We had a lot of errands to do that day when they had other things going on. They might say something like, we will try. And I knew that they would try, and they honestly would. They would try to make that happen. But I knew if they promised me, it was going to happen. See, the weight of a promise is determined by the quality of the character of the person making it. The problem is when it comes to making promises, to keeping promises, and trusting in the promises of others, is that people can be fickle. True story? Fickle. What does it mean to be fickle? Uh, people can be changeable, inconsistent, unpredictable, unstable, volatile. Uh, we have all undoubtedly been the recipients and perpetrators of some fickleness. After all, someone can, can love you one minute and hate you the next. I think about it always, and I've used this example before in terms of football season in the South. Uh, when it comes right down to it, you can be watching and keeping up with the team all season long and seeing the praises of the quarterback, never have seen, never thrown plays like you've seen before. They are perfect in every way. It comes time for the biggest game of the season. They mess up one play, and what happens? Oh, they're awful. I knew that they were going to mess that up. From Didn't you say yesterday how much you, well, I didn't mean it. No. You can win the lottery and be surrounded by friends and spend all the money and find out how quickly you are deserted. What people want can change day to day, and what people want from you can change day to day. And the problem of fickleness seeps into promise making because someone may make a promise to you on one day, and that promise may change the next. 
And all this can be driven by moods and desires. But think of it like this. The promises people make are fickle, or can be fickle, not only because they are subject to the moods of people, but they're also subject to time. We can make a promise that we're going to do something for all time, but we can't make that promise because why? We don't live for all time. This is what I love. This is summed up so well in Psalm 146, verses 3 through 4, where the psalmist writes, Don't trust leaders. Don't trust any human beings. There's no saving help with them. Their breath leaves them. Then they go back to the ground. On that very same day, their plans die too. And what the psalmist is clearly saying is that a king or a ruler may make a promise to you and uphold that promise. But the problem is, once the king or ruler dies, there's going to be a new king or ruler, and the promise may change. And that there might not be a promise. Now, hear the good news. Hear the good news for this morning when we talk about promise and advent. People are fickle, but God is not. God has not changed day to day. Scripture tells us that every day the mercies of God are new, but not His attitude. Every day the mercies of God are new, but not his promises. His promises remain true. That is the character of God. God does not change. God is not erratic. God does not move without purpose, and that purpose is consistent. God is gracious, and God is good, and that does not change. Thanks be to God. That is the character of God, and this leads us to the promises of God. When God makes a promise, God keeps a promise. That is Advent. That is the season of Advent. God said he would send a Savior all throughout the centuries before Jesus is born through the prophets. There are all the promises made by the prophets that the word of the Lord comes to a prophet and says there is one on his way. God will send someone, and that is a promise coming from God. And we celebrate in Advent that God keeps his promise because he promises the Savior, and here comes the Savior. And what we celebrate is that God's word is true and it is eternal, that God is not subject to death. And so what God decrees and what God promises is not just for our lifetime, it is for eternity. We read about the unfolding of this promise of a Savior by being introduced to two people named Zechariah and Elizabeth. And this is the only time we hear about these two folks all throughout Scripture. And this is where it's important to spend a little time, just a moment, uh, to recognize and remember that names in the Bible are not just names. They always have meaning. They're always coming again from a combination of, uh, in the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, Hebrew words. And sometimes a lot of folks will name their children after characters in the Bible, and then you go back and actually look up what that that, that meaning actually does mean. But we take Zechariah, for instance. Zechariah's name means God has remembered, and Elizabeth means my God's oath. And if you know these meanings, you will know that God is about to do something big Because here's Zechariah with the name meaning God has remembered, and your immediate question should be what? What is God remembering? What is being remembered? When you talk about Elizabeth and my God's oath, what oath is being talked about there? If you know those meanings, you will know that God is about to do something big. So we need to look at this, verses 6 and 7. What do we know about Zechariah and Elizabeth? We read these words. They were both righteous before God, Blameless in their observance of all the Lord's commandments and regulations, they had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant, and they were both very old. What I want you to hear this morning is this, as we get into this idea, of, uh, this, 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 not this idea, this celebration of promise. God is not a fickle God. God is not fickle in the promises he makes. And we're introduced very on in the early, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, to two believers who are not fickle in their walk with the Lord. The way they are described could only be based on their shared commitment to worship, to prayer, to scripture, and extending acts of mercy. It is clear that their relationship with God is built not on going through the motions, but on their love of God. And I would also highlight that Zechariah and Elizabeth must have shared a true love for one another, a true commitment to each other, because in Zechariah's day, remember, the fact that Elizabeth could not become pregnant was a ground for divorce. But Zechariah doesn't do that. In fact, Zechariah and Elizabeth remain married all throughout the years. And the only real explanation here is that Zechariah loved Elizabeth. 
But there is still the hurdle. Elizabeth cannot conceive. In Zechariah's day, this would have been seen as a curse. And yet they are consistent in their worship. Although, by the way, you know that people talked. And why is it safe to say that? Because people always talk. You can be so committed to God that the Bible describes you as being blameless and keeping all the commands and ordinances, but people will still talk, and they will inevitably talk about what they perceive to be false, because so often people love false instead of facts. But Luke begins his gospel by saying he is providing an account of God providing a Messiah. So at the very beginning of the gospel of Luke, we have a few things going on. We have a God who has not fickle, who has promised a Messiah. We have two people who are not fickle in their relationship with God or one another, but there is a hurdle of Elizabeth being unable to conceive. So how does this play out? And how is it that God working through Zechariah and Elizabeth reveal more of the character of God? Not just that God is not fickle, but that God is constantly at work in their lives. God is constantly at work in our lives. There's never a time when God is not at work. How do the names of Zechariah and Elizabeth Tip, tip us off that God is about to work in a big way. And here's another question for you, as if those aren't enough. Why do we celebrate Advent every year? Have you ever wondered that? Why we come together as the church and we celebrate these seasons in the life of the church? Why we light the Advent wreath? Why we do what we do? Well, here, here's, here's what I would go with. Recognizing all of this, that God does not have a memory lapse in making and keeping promises because God is not fickle. But we have a memory lapse in remembering them because we are. We're people. We're people. That's why it's such a joy when we come together and celebrate Advent because we are reliving and not just reliving but remembering that God keeps promises. That God promised a Savior, sent a Savior. And that should speak powerfully to our lives today as we're about to see it should speak powerfully in the life of Zechariah and Elizabeth. We're going to get into this. And I, and I love where this is headed. At, so just, just stay with me this morning. But here's how the scene plays out. Zechariah is in the temple, and he's doing um, what priests do. But Zechariah is in the temple performing his priestly duties, and he is alone at the altar offering incense. And all of a sudden, an angel appears, and we read, The angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will give birth to your son, and you must name him John. And we read Zechariah's response in verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, what? He says, get real. He says this. I mean, really, I mean, that's that's the, uh, (laughs) the New Revised Mark translation. Okay, but he says, He says this, how can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. I was sent to speak to you and bring this good news. What I want you to catch this morning is this, because this speaks to us if nothing else will. Notice what happens. Follow me along on this. Zechariah has a memory lapse um, concerning God's promises and how God fulfills them. And before I get far, too far into this, I want to make one thing absolutely clear. When I say that Zechariah has memory lapse, I don't want this to sound like, uh, make this sound like this is a fault-finding mission about Zechariah. Because uh, again, I said at the beginning, it's too easy and it's always a temptation to find faults in someone else instead of lift up what's actually going on and recognize the situation, is it not? So it's an easy thing to say, well, Zechariah has a memory lapse. Come on, Zechariah, get real. You're a priest. You should know better, right? I mean, I would know better. I wouldn't question the angel. But let's replay this for a minute. Zechariah is in the temple, and again, not to go into the math of this, it's a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Zechariah has probably never done this before. It was all done by lottery. Uh, Zechariah was a priest, but guess how many priests there were at this time? 20,000, 20,000 priests, not Sadducees, by the way, not the really rich folk. I'm talking about the average everyday Joe who was descended from a line of priests and they got uh, by lottery drawn and they got their, 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 their letter in the mail. It didn't come that way, but you know, hey, show up to the temple, you're on duty. 
So he's there, he's doing the incense for the first time, and probably the last time he will ever do it. And an angel shows up and, and, and says, hey, Zachariah, you're going to have a child. Here is what you're going to name him. Here is what he's going to eat, by the way. Here are his dietary restrictions. Um, he's going to turn a whole lot of people back to the Lord. And oh, by the way, he's preparing the way for the Messiah that everybody in, <laughs> has been in waiting for, including you. And his reaction is, Huh? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. And maybe some of you, I'll just be honest with you this morning, and maybe some Bibles are around here, uh, some of y'all are reading are bigger, but I, I would look at that and I'd say, if I was in that situation, not only would I question, I would probably faint. I would probably fall right out in the sanctuary. Not only what you say can, it is not going to happen, it cannot happen. Do you know what's going on in my life? Here are the barriers to what you're declaring. Hmm. But Zechariah does doubt because he says he's old. And Zechariah, here's, here's where I want, I want you to stay with me this morning. Zechariah wants proof. When he says, how can I be sure of this, what is he asking for? He wants some proof. Don't miss that. He says, okay, you say this is going to happen. Prove it to me that what you're saying can happen to me. Prove what you're saying, that what God has said is true in my life. Prove it to me, Gabriel. And this is the textbook example of how we can be blind to how God's promises have worked in our life and brought us to where we are. Here's where I'm going with this. There is another story of a couple who is very old, and they receive a word from God that they are going to have a child at old age. And this child will go on to do great things. Now, some of you hopefully are thinking all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you're thinking about chapter 17 and verse 18 and on, and you will remember a man named Abraham. And you will remember a wife named Sarah. The Word of God comes to, actually, God speaks to Abraham, um, and Sarah overhears it from an angel, and when they hear the news they're going to have a child, what do they do? They both fall down laughing. Isaac's name, again, a little Hebrew study for you, means he laughs. Because why? Abraham laughs. God, how can it be? I am too old to have a child. My wife's too old. We are too old. This cannot happen. And yet God makes a covenant with Abraham that he will be the father of a nation. And they have a child named Isaac. And Abraham has other children. But we fast forward many, 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 many generations. And guess who? Zachariah's great, 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 so here's where I'm going with this. Zechariah, you are saying you want proof that God is about to do what God said he would do. You want proof. I, I, this is my, my, the Mark Revised translation. The angel ought to say, aren't you standing here? Hmm? Aren't you standing right here? You want proof. Zechariah, you would not be alive if God did not keep his promises. Zechariah, you are the proof. The fact that you are standing here is the proof that God never forgets a promise, that God can overcome any challenge, that nothing is impossible with God. Let that be the word for this morning. The fact that you are standing here is testimony that God keeps his promises because there are all some situations that we should not have made it through. There is no logical ex reason or explanation that we should be standing here today if God had not been a God who keeps promises. The promise is a Messiah would be sent, and that sin and death would be defeated, and that promise was kept. And because of that promise being kept, Paul can write in Romans chapter 8, what? What can separate us from the love of God? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Nothing can. Not the fact that we are sinners. Can't separate us from the love of God. Not the mountains, not the valleys. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The promise is that through Christ Jesus, the presence of God is a presence in our lives each and every day. And that is a promise that is made, that is, that is kept, that is a promise that does not die with us, but it extends to all generations. Zechariah is the result of a promise that was made more than a thousand years before by God. 
And yet there he stands. Zechariah, you want proof? Sometimes we get together and we say, I want proof. God's working in my life. And we say, well, wait a minute. Read your Bibles. Pray about it. I'm still standing here. I'm still, and I shouldn't be. God has been at work. God keeps his promises. <laughs> that is a promise that is not just for the future. But that, see, see how this, these promises impact us now? I mean, the promise found in Psalm 23 that we will find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death, but that God will lead us through. The promise that we will go through some mess in life, and that is guaranteed, but that God will lead us through, and that his presence is always near to us. And the challenge can be, we can turn to Scripture and say, oh, Zechariah, oh, Abraham, oh, on the list goes. But you know, I live in the 21st century, God. Well, I don't, did God know that? You know. Yes, but what we celebrate is that God is not fickle. The words of Scripture point to the character of God. It is not just what God has done, but what God is doing and what God will do. During the season of Advent, fight the temptation to have a memory lapse when it comes to the mercies of God. This is incredibly for some, and it's a sad thing, but one of the most stressful times of the year in more ways than one. Every morning when you get up, thank God that God is a God who keeps promises. And if you ever doubt that, remember that you are still standing here. And there have been times in my life that if God and his mercy had not brought me through, I would not be standing here. There have been times in my life that I can take no credit for getting through on my own strength. It was the strength of God alone. And we come through that on the other side and how easy it is to forget that God has brought us through. You can say, well, I want proof God's working in my life. Well, look in the mirror. We're standing here. Here we are. What proof could we ask from God that God is at work in our lives? What proof could we ask from God that God is greater than a human-made obstacle or a human-made storm? Again, here we stand. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Most merciful Lord, we thank you this morning that you are a God of promises. That as you have made a promise, you always keep a promise. And your promise to send a Savior into the world was kept. And kept in such a way, met in such a way, it exceeded all of our expectations. Because how could we as a people fully and truly expect how much love you would show to the world and the mercy you would show to the world to send your only son. And so we pray this morning that we would live in the transformation of the promise, the promise that you make, that we would see that in fact your character is one that is not fickle, does not change day to day, that you have brought us through the years of our life. You will continue to be with us from now until eternity because the promise you have made through Christ Jesus is not subject to sin and death because you are not subject to sin and death. And so we thank you this morning for who you are, and we are thankful this morning for whose we are. We pray that each and every day we would stand not our own, on our own understanding, not our own desires, but we would truly stand on your promises. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we come now to our time of communion, uh, I would begin by asking, has everyone received their prepackaged communion elements? And if you haven't, I see one hand going up the back. If you haven't, just raise your hands or hand, and we will uh, uh, get those to you. Oh, well, both hands. <laughs> the second I said that, I think multiple people, one hand being raised, and then it's going to be taking one person, both hands raised. But that's all right. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Well, as we enter into this time of communion, um, just a few brief words. One is, again, uh, they are prepackaged elements, but I would ask that you please wait until the time, and I will announce that time, to open them because they are plastic. They do make quite a bit of noise and can be very distracting, so I ask that you, you please wait on that. We will take the time that is needed for everybody to open those up and to uh, partake of them. Um, and with that, also, uh, also a brief reminder, um, Following communion, if you would please hold on to your prepackaged element, the trash that's produced, the empty container. Uh, we do have a wastebasket available at the exit of our worship space, so as you're going out, uh, please do, uh, throw those away in there. Uh, with that being said, let us begin now in celebrating.
our time of Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved You with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done Your will. We have broken Your law. We have rebelled against Your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Christ took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast this heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to take your prepackaged elements and peel back the first layer, reveal the wafer. Once you have that open, take that. And then when you are ready to peel back the second layer, partake of the juice. Let's pray together. Most merciful Lord, we thank you for 
feeding us through your word and the sacrament. That you, through your character, through your mercy, through your grace, and through your great love, have made us into people of a promise. And we celebrate that you have made that promise to provide a savior. You have kept that promise. And through the keeping of that promise, we are forever different. We pray this morning that through communion, through scripture, through prayer, through worship, through the work and leading of your Holy Spirit, we would continue every day to grow in the reality of that promise and the difference it makes in our lives. For in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Isn't that fun to see them jump up and run up here? Man, I'm so glad to have choir back. Well, it's been a great morning. The sun has shone in here. We've shared a meal together. We've loved on one another, cared for one another. Great way to start the day, start the week. Let's stand together and sing. Our uh, closing hymn is... Good Christian friends rejoice. That's what we are. Regardless if you like me or not, I love you. <laughs> and we're friends. We are friends. Receive this benediction. Go now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.